So, welcome to this forum, sir. I would like to set the context for the discussion today. So, I would like to repeat what I said earlier. The theme for today's discussion is the innovation triggered transformation and uh, su sustaining a shared vision of India Japan partnership. Ishikawa-san will share the outline of Toshiba, Toshiba's relationship with India, and the journey of Toshiba software in India, uh, quoting several insights. Based on uh, this uh, overview, we will discuss why he believes India and Japan could be one of the best partner relationships, uh, especially with regard to innovation. And we would also like to discuss what are the challenges of uh, in this relationship, and also his future vision of collaboration, especially on innovation initiatives. So over to you, Ishigawa. Uh, thank you, Sajib san. Let me share my screen. Yes. Okay, so hope uh, you see my screen now. Yes, we can see. Okay, all right. Okay, so once again, thank you, Sajib san, for the introduction. I'm Takashi Ishikawa, a managing director of Toshiba Software India, and also the chairperson of the Japanese Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Bangalore. It is my great pleasure to be invited to uh, speak at this prestigious platform, uh, Tatsujin Speak. Since uh, Toshiba Software India has a great relationship with IMB, over the past uh, six years. My talk for today will be centered around innovation as uh, introduced by uh, Sajib Sun. Let me start by making a tall and true claim. Innovation is in Toshiba's DNA. Today, we find it so easy to connect with our peers across the world virtually sitting across our laptop PCs, just like uh, what I'm doing now. And uh, Toshiba has been a pioneer to make this possible, among others. And without the early contributions to IT from companies like Toshiba, today's normal would not have been possible. So way back in 1985, Toshiba launched world's first notebook PC, that is T1100, that set up the path to the world of today. By the way, the data storage for this T1100 was a three and a half inch floppy disk drive. I'm not sure how many of you from, especially the younger generation, used floppy disk, but floppy disk was the most popular data storage around 35 years ago. The capacity was only around 1.4 megabytes. And the floppy disk was replaced with HDD hard disk drive, and then replaced with NAND flash memory. In 1989, Toshiba invented this NAND flash memory, which surpassed previous types of non-volatile memory in terms of capacity, performance, and quality. The data storage industry was changed forever for good with this groundbreaking innovation from Toshiba. Toshiba is also credited with developing world's first mail processing equipment way back in 1967. Toshiba developed world's first automatic postal code reading and sorting device that could recognize handwritten characters. 
a product that realized image recognition back in the 1960s, much earlier than any AI tech companies nowadays were established. By the way, in 2019, in terms of the number of the patents filed in the area of AI, Toshiba was globally number three, uh, just following IBM and uh, Microsoft. Toshiba is also selected as top 100 global innovators for 10 consecutive years. Toshiba was established in 1875, and today Toshiba Group products and service delivers products and services worldwide in energy systems and solutions, infrastructure systems and solutions, building solutions, retail and printing solutions, electronic devices and storage solutions, digital solutions, and battery business. Toshiba's global research and development infrastructure has helped the company in creating innovative products. Toshiba has released numerous world first and Japan first products, establishing strong credentials for Toshiba as an organization focused towards the innovations for better human life. And as you can see here, Toshiba Software India is regarded as one of the major R&D bases in Toshiba. From here on, I would like to share with you how Toshiba perceives the world today and in which way Toshiba can contribute to solving those issues based on its innovative technologies. These are the social issues and macro trends that we are paying attention to. The conversion to renewable energy is being promoted worldwide. We are also faced with the threat of natural disasters we have never experienced. There's a growing need for resilience of infrastructure such as power supply and water sewage. The crisis of the new coronavirus are expected to be long-term. And there is a need for a shift to new life cycles and social systems. On the other hand, there are also need to utilize cutting edge technologies such as advanced medical care that contribute to healthy life expectancy and quantum related technologies. Toshiba is working to solve the problems the world is facing by developing new technologies, by utilizing the experiences cultivated through many years of energy and infrastructure business experiences. This slide shows the basic configuration of Toshiba's CPS technology. By the way, CPS stands for Cyber Physical System which creates the infrastructure service to solve the social issues. We will use the IoT technology to collect data from the physical devices, the edge components and systems that are Toshiba's strengths, then build digital twins in the cyberspace. By analyzing data using AI, and feeding it back to the physical space, we will improve the operation of the components and system. We will build CPS with an open IoT reference architecture and, and provide infrastructure service as a Toshiba Spinex brand. I will share with you some case studies for solving social issues. First, with the initiative of decarbonization. Toshiba has many related technologies in the field of generate energy, transfer energy, store energy, and use energy smartly. The amount of re renewable energies that plays a major role in decarbonization fluctuates depending on weather and other factors. Toshiba is developing energy adjustment technology centered on the virtual power plants. In addition to 
power generation technology in order to make renewable energy the main power source. We are also developing technologies for effective use of energy, such as electrification of mo mobility, utilization of energy saving technologies, such as power electronics, and recycling of CO2 emitted from thermal power plants. Toshiba will promote decarbonization throughout the energy chain. Let me introduce some of the highly innovative technology in the healthcare by Toshiba. In the area of prevention, we can predict the risk of illness up to five years from now by inputting the results of the medical examination into the preventive risk prediction AI. In addition, if you enter the disease risk reduction target and target weight in the newly developed AI that process lifestyle related improvement. In the area of health diagnosis, we have developed a highly accurate cancer detection technology using microRNA in blood for early detection for cancer. With a microRNA chip developed by Toshiba and a small inspection device, the inspection can be performed in a short time. A blood test with less physical burden enables early detection of cancer and is expected to improve the quality of life and survival rate of the cancer patients. In the future, we will verify the practicality through demonstration tests and collaboration with medical institutions and accelerate efforts towards early commercialization. Another cutting tech edge technology focus area is uh, quantum computers. In the interest of time and the uh, complexity of the technology, I will not go into detail, but I'm proud to say Toshiba is one of the global leaders in quantum computer technologies, especially in the area of quantum cryptography. Let me share Toshiba's journey in India. The ties between Toshiba and India go back to almost 60 years over activities. Uh, and our activities are rooted in the Indian community. Toshiba's relationship with India started in 1960s when we installed the turbine generators at hydropower plants in Karnataka and Meghalaya states. Today, India is our global manufacturing plus software development base and an export hub. Toshiba is on track with over 3,000 pro rupees investment since 2013. And we currently employ over 8,000 people in India. We are committed to the Make in India initiative and already not just making in India, but also exporting from India. Toshiba today has a large presence in India with business interests across a variety of power and infrastructure businesses. As you can see, Toshiba is promoting business across top cities in India through existing eight group companies, including uh, Toshiba Software India. To take India-Japan synergy to the next level, we are now actively seeking to collaborate with Indian companies to do business globally. We believe that Toshiba's advanced technologies and global expertise combined with Indian partners' engineering skills and cultural and business influence can provide high quality solutions, not just to Indian customers, but also globally. One recent example of Make in India by Toshiba is the manufacturing of SCIB. The SIB, SCIB, our rechargeable battery is worth your attention for features that include excellent safety, long life, rapid charging, and high input and output. These features make SCIB ideal for regenerative power systems and hybrid vehicles, where it contributes to improved fuel consumption efficiency and reduces CO2 emissions. 
We have established a joint venture to set up India's first automotive lithium ion battery factory in Gujarat, which will soon start to manufacture this advanced battery. This is an example of the global business partnership with the Indian company. Toshiba has already concluded a contract with LNT to deliver eight sets of traction energy storage system, in short, TESS, powered by the SCIB battery. And this is for the Dhaka Mass Rapid Transit Line 6 in Bangladesh. Their delivery for the project has already started, and this will be the first overseas delivery of this, this uh, TESS system for Toshiba. India has seen tremendous economic growth over the last few decades. While the growth has been good for economy, it has brought the twin challenges of air and water pollu pollution along with it. It is heartening to see the government of India take strong initiative to fight these challenges, the Clean Ganga Initiative and FAME Initiative to boost faster conversion to electrical vehicles are quite commendable. Toshiba Water Solutions, in short TWS, a leading water and wastewater treatment company based in India, has a proven track record of executing over 450 projects in 35 countries. Under the Indian government's Clean Ganga Initiative, TWS is involved in projects in three states for the construction of 10 sewage treatment plants. So till now, I talked about Toshiba. And uh, from now on, I will mainly talk about Toshiba Software India, uh, in short, TSIP or TSIP. So we are a software development center based in Bangalore and also Pune. Our main mission is to develop software which are embedded into the Toshiba products and systems. We have over 1,000 talented AI and IT engineers helping to make Toshiba an excellent CPS cyber physical system company. TSIP is the largest overseas software development center in the whole Toshiba group. As you can easily imagine, CPS heavily depends on software. So we are one of the most crucial development centers in the Toshiba group. We started our journey from 2002 as an ODC, ODC stands for Offshore Development Center, to develop LSI software for Toshiba Semiconductor Company, which was an in-house company of Toshiba. Then we expanded our area of products to embedded software. And soon after TSIP moved under the Toshiba headquarter management that happened in 2010, we drastically expanded our domain scope, such as energy and infrastructure, information systems application, and AI related R&D. Through this journey, TSIP is evolving itself from ODC to COE, which is Center of Excellence. I know that there are many definitions of ODC, Offshore Development Center, and COE, Center of Excellence. But in today's context, we can simply think that the major difference between ODC and COE is whether Innovation is expected or not. One of the epoch making events for the transition from ODC to COE was the establishment of the R&D division in 2012. This is to produce the AI applied solutions in India for Toshiba products and services. The researches here are done in collaboration with Indian universities, as well as the Toshville's global R&D centers, which I uh, touched upon in the earlier slide. 
But the journey was not really straightforward. We faced many challenges because of the gaps between two countries. Well, apart from language gap, these are the main gaps we faced when we have a collaborative software development between India and Japan, such as quality mind, decision-making process, punctuality, documentation, mobility of human resources, patience, and requirement specification and criteria. Actually, I can spend more than an hour to discuss this slide only, but in the interest of time, uh, we shall uh, move on. Well, in order to fill the gap, we did many things. We assigned bridge engineers. We sent our engineers to Japan for long term. We invited Japanese engineers to India. We applied common software development processes. We did many things. But what I want to emphasize here is that I'm not saying which is good or bad, meaning whether India is good or India is bad. It's just that there are differences. So I think Japan side also need to pay effort to fill this gap. And um, one attempt to fill the gap by changing Japan side is this global IT training, uh, which we provide uh, here in Bangalore. We invite young engineers, mainly from Japan, to provide project management training based on global standard. Uh, since 2015, we already, uh, over 100 uh, graduates completed this program. And this is uh, the five week training program. And uh, the main session of this uh, program is the case study session. The case studies were developed in collaboration with IIMB and uh, this program really serves as an eye opener for the participants. And I'm really happy that many of the graduates come back to TSIP as customer. So this is a really good ecosystem for our business as well. By the way, the program is named as a global IT training, not India IT training, since Indian software industry is pretty much following the global standard. And on the other hand, Japan is quite unique, at least from the software development perspective. This is only my personal view, but I would like to share with you Japan's uniqueness and how it might be influencing innovation in Japan. That is Japanese admiration for Tatsujin. Well, uh, I also wanted to connect this with the title of the webinar, Tatsujin Speak. Tatsujin is expert or master in English language, but to my understanding, it has more implications like long-term devotion to specific area of technology or art, not much interest in career, financial, or business success. These uh, implies that uh, the Tasujin would spend long period of time to master certain technology or art. Maybe they devote their life, whole life, to achieve something, which goes quite well with the lifetime employment. And if you look at those characteristics, those are really good for incremental innovation, pursuit for quality perfection, and hardware development or manufacturing and their improvement, and fundamental research, which creates the seeds for the innovation. What are common on these uh, four items are, all of them require long-term effort and uh, it has to be continuous. 
But on the other hand, Tatsujin may not always be really good for transformation. Transformation here, by the way, uh, means disruptive innovation or leapfrog innovation and information technology related uh, development where technology changes too frequently and quick application adaptation to and agility to change. Finally, the knowledge transfer. So what is common in these four items are these require disconnection. So there will be some discontinuity. And uh, then uh, what will happen with these Tatsujin? They may not like discontinuity because once the transformation happens, whatever their achievement or whatever they accumulated may become obsolete. So sometimes the Tatsujin may become even a resistance for transformation. So this might be the dilemma of uh, the Tatsujin. And through my experience in India, I think Indian people are good at those aspects on the right-hand side. And that is why I believe India and Japan can complement each other so we could be the best partner. I personally feel Toshiba has many Tatsujins. That is why Toshiba has been an innovative company for over a century. But on the other hand, something is lacking, which I believe is entrepreneurship. Toshiba is selected as top 100 global innovators for 10 consecutive years. Toshiba was global number three in terms of the number of patents filed in the year of AI. But those innovative capabilities are not enough connected with business success these days, which I believe is because of lack of entrepreneurship. Toshiba is already aware of that and started to take actions. One of the actions is this Toshiba Accelerator Program. This program supports Toshiba employees to start so-called carve-out business. They establish a startup company based on technologies invented by Toshiba. And in this case, uh, this is actually uh, introduced in the Toshiba webpage. Uh, sorry, it's in Japanese, so it might be difficult uh, for the Indian people to read through. But in this particular case, uh, the VC, the venture capitalist, the Beyond Next Ventures is funding this startup company. Another recent news which surprised me was that some of the Toshiba Group companies now allows their employees to do side business. Utilizing this policy, one of the graduates from the global IT training launched a startup company as his side business. And I'm really proud that according to him, his experience at the global IT training in India inspired him. So from these movements, I see Toshiba is trying to add the entrepreneurship in Toshiba's DNA. This is uh, the final slide of my presentation today. In my presentation, I introduced Toshiba and Toshiba Software India. Then based on my experience, both in Japan and in India, I shared with you why I believe India and Japan could be the best partner. I also touched upon what are the challenges and how we can overcome the challenges. I also shared with you that Toshiba is encouraging entrepreneurship. And finally, I would like to share with you my future vision at Toshiba Software India. Considering all those uh, backgrounds, I would like to influence Japan from India to create joint innovation and entrepreneurship. 
Thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. I think uh, that was a wonderful uh, introduction to this uh, whole, um, very much, I would say, debated uh, also internally mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, within our uh, various stakeholders. We all always debate that though India and Japan relationship has been uh, so long standing, but it seems to be stuck in a lower orbit. It is not going to the higher orbit. Mm. I think you have captured many of those, uh, 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 some of those uh, very uh, important reasons why it is so. so. What is interesting also about what the base that you have set so far, you have also sold some solutions that you are trying out, uh, like um, the accelerator program and also the support systems that you are creating for uh, site businesses for employees. Mm -hmm. These are great initiatives and I think many companies in, uh, in from Japan can also learn from this. I have uh, um, some questions, some, some of them are some follow-up questions, but um, actually we had a speaker before you, um, Professor uh, Kusumano, uh, Michael Kusumano, who is a deputy dean at uh, MIT in the USA. And uh, he is said very similar to what you just now mm. said. And uh, the Japan Innovation capacity is very high, as one can see from the patent file. Whereas the uh, entrepreneurial ability, uh, as measured in terms of number of startups, is uh, quite low. Um, so you seem to uh, very much agree with that uh, point. But um, could you also share with all of us why do you think? This is happening. I mean, what is the genesis for this particular gap between innovation capacity and entrepreneurial capacity? Yes, uh, Saeed San. So uh, I think partially I already uh, touched upon in my presentation. So maybe one. The particular thing is uh, still Japan. In Japan, the lifetime employment is uh, quite the normal way of uh, working. And uh, so people uh, in Japan tends to stay in the comfort zone. So meaning, so they can make some innovation in the company, but uh, they, just want to be inside of the company, but not to take the risk to like uh, start something new by leaving the company. And uh, I also joined the session with the Kusman song last month, which was quite enlightening. And I fully agree with the Kusman song's view. And he also mentioned the fear of failure uh, that is uh, in Japanese mind. In addition to that, I would say there's a cost of failure. Because, uh, for example, uh, in India, what I see is that uh, many people try, but if it doesn't work well, they find new opportunity. But in Japan, I don't think it's that easy to find the new, the next uh, better opportunity. For example, uh, if uh, may maybe the Japanese uh, uh, the fresher would like to join a uh, company like Toshiba, uh, they have to join as a fresher, most likely. And once uh, you leave Toshiba, there's a less chance that uh, you work for such a uh, big company. That is a scenario till now, but I think that even is slowly changing. So we might see some change, meaning 
the uh, more flexible the work or the liquidity of the employment. And uh, hopefully that would push the uh, Japanese people to move towards the entrepreneurship. Uh, wonderful. I think uh, you did uh, talk, Mark. I mean, you talked about mobility. Right. Being, um, you know, especially lifetime employment. Gives you some sort of a comfort uh, feeling, feeling of mm. comfort. You try to break that in Toshiba by allowing people to not just be an employee, but also create some sort of a side business. Exactly. So, yeah. Uh, and that actually reminds me that in one of uh, the companies where I had worked, mm -hmm. uh, encouraging the employees to um, become entrepreneurs and become suppliers to our, us. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> so this way, uh, we, we got suppliers who understood our culture. Mm -hmm. as well. I think uh, that is another probably another dimension <laughs> we could uh, right, right. Shiba also could, uh, mm -hmm. think of. But uh, tell me one thing, uh, uh, according to you, mm -hmm. what is the role of uh, innovation in mm -hmm. uh, addressing uh, the current uh, challenges, which uh, whether the company level or at the nation level, uh, we are all facing um, problems in growth and problems in uh, meeting customer requirements. Mm -hmm. So in your opinion, the role of innovation, focus on innovation. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, for Toshiba, uh, I think uh, I uh, shared with you one slide. As explained, uh, Toshiba perceives uh, the the social issues uh, like this, and uh, the Toshiba stock commitment is like committed to work, people committed to people, uh, committed people committed to world. So it's like the, definitely the innovation should be one way to solve these kind of issue, and. Um, we, sh in order for this, I think um, the technology is really required, and um, that's why uh, Toshiba is here and uh, to help the to make the world a better place. Hope that answers uh, your question. Um, one uh, question. Mm -hmm current scenario where businesses are becoming more and more dependent mm. on digitalization of the business. Um, how can organizations focus on improving the quality of uh, uh, the software? The software mm. is, uh, is a link for any uh, digitalization of business. Mm. Mm. So, as an expert in this area, what would be your advice to these companies? How they can improve reliability and uh, efficiency of the software processes? Mm -hmm. So you're talking about the uh, quality of the software or the quality of the software development process? Um, in a way, both, of mm course. -hmm. So one leads to the other in, in the longer perspective. But I yes. see. Yeah. Well, uh, this is a very interesting question because uh, I think in order to answer your question, um, we need to revisit what, what is the uh, definition of the software quality? Because uh, now in a narrow definition maybe the software quality is like uh, the as you mentioned reliability 
or availability and so on, right? Which are defined in like ISO or something. But now in the world of digitalization, we have to see the quality in a different way. And um, what I think really important is in the uh, age of the digitalization for software is to see from the perspective of how much you are in line with what customer expects. So first thing you need to do is you have to define what you expect from software for the digitalization. Uh, in these days, uh, I feel like the, the, even the customers are not really sure what they want. So only through some discussion, you really understand what they're really expecting. And uh, there are some cases like uh, they want to introduce AI. They want to introduce machine learning. They want to introduce deep learning. And yeah, of course uh, we can meet such a requirement. That is a requirement, but we are not sure whether that is the really right approach, right? So they, they have a different kind of requirement. They want, they want something to solve by introducing digitalization. And you have to capture that and you have to see whether you are in line with the quality should be measured towards that perspective. That is my understanding. And coming to the narrow meaning of the, the software, one the problem is that uh, these days, software heavily depends on the open source software. Means we do not have the full control in terms of the quality of the software in the narrow meaning. Right? So, and also the, uh, when it comes to the deep learning, I think most of the people cannot really understand what is going on inside, okay? So this is something I still do not have to have the answer, but uh, my high level answer to that question, the question of the how digitalization, uh, the software quality can be assured in the uh, digitalization is that you should redefine the quality, the meaning of the quality. Yeah, I think, you mm. have answered very well in terms of um, because the customer himself sometimes you say that he's not aware. Mm. So I have to through discussions you bring that out, and I think that is the key to starting off the process of uh, uh, building a good product, uh, especially software product. Mm. So uh, India actually was uh, traditionally, um, you know that um, when Kusumano was uh, Professor Kusumano was talking about how uh, India was traditionally weak on innovation front, but um, and especially entrepreneurship also. Mm -hmm. But uh, over these last uh, few uh, years, we have seen. Uh, things are changing, and many, as you also mentioned, that uh, changing because uh, people are ready to take the risk. And uh, in a way, you have answered this question, but I would like to explore as a person who has worked in both India and um, what do you think? are the differences in innovation culture. Of course, you did mention about the culture in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Seven, uh, key points. Hey, um, hey. Starting with quality of mind, mind approach to quality. Decision then you talk about behavioral aspects like punctuality. Mm -hmm. uh, detailed the documentation. Then you did talk about mobility as a Probably precursor to uh, discouraging innovation and also patience. And uh, could you little more expand on that aspect about uh, patience 
uh, how that uh, affect our um, innovation culture and that is incremental innovation and what do you think are the um, you can call it transformational innovation or breakthrough innovation are there a different mindsets required for these two yes i think so so uh, let me give one example right um regarding this incremental innovation uh, i will share with you uh, my recent experience while i was back in japan uh, in august so when i went back to japan so the vaccination was starting in japan However, since I live in India and I'm just tentatively visiting Japan, I do not have the residential certificate in Japan. So I'm not, I was not eligible for taking the vaccination in Japan. But uh, they, thanks to the government, uh, they uh, started the vaccination drive for those who are tentatively back in Japan. And uh, that happened in the airport oh okay. Haneda airport and Naita airport okay. and uh, that vaccination drive started from 1st of august and actually i visited the airport to get the shot at the very first day so you can imagine there will be a lot of disorganization at the first day of the drive right and uh, yeah, of course, uh, uh, they did the best, but uh, there are many room for improvement, right? And uh, things are not really streamlined. But after three weeks, since I took the Pfizer vaccine, I had to take the three weeks interval. And it was on 22nd of August. So I again visited the same place, but everything was perfectly smooth. Everything, the process was optimized. However, if you look at each of the process, everything was paper-based or manual-based. And um, after I complete the vaccination, they issue the uh, vaccination certificate. That is also paper-based. So this is one good example that Japanese people do remarkable thing in improving the current process or the current way. However, if you think about that, what if you make it full digital, digitalized, right? So for example, uh, the, the vaccination certificate itself can be digitalized, right? And that is actually happening in India. And uh, it is really remarkable to see uh, that COVID site in India that covers the whole India, right? And then that is not happening in Japan at all. So this kind of uh, difference, clear difference in the approach or the mindset is there. So I think in order for Japan to really appreciate the benefit of digitalization, you have to really think totally in a different way. But this also needs some courage because that means you have to abandon the current way, which was optimally done, right? So that kind of uh, courage is required in the whole Japanese society. That is my view. Thank you. I think your uh, um, small case study that you quoted has brought home uh, this point that incremental mm -hmm. uh, versus transformational. Uh, so you are very right. Uh, we, in, including the, the government of India, mm -hmm. did put out this uh, uh, new approach uh, with very little time to perfect it. So uh, in the process, we we did have a lot of glitches in the exactly. Industry. Right, right. And I think uh, the Indian people are quite generous about that. Exactly, exactly. We uh, pardon all the glitches 
so long as yeah. some fruit is tasty at the end of <laughs> But yeah. uh, y you don't really uh, get to know what is the problem if you do not uh, try, right? So yeah, just logically thinking has some limitation. So it's much easier to find what is the problem by the practice. So that way I really like the Indian approach. And uh, of course uh, there are pros and cons, but if the Japanese people and Indian people can be combined in an appropriate way. Uh, this will be, I think, the strongest combination in the world. So um, there is uh, some questions, a lot of questions actually from the mm -hmm. audience. Uh, read out uh, one of them. Mm -hmm. What is the extent of um, experience sharing between various Japanese, your own Japanese companies and managers uh, with, with those who are uh, operating in India. Do these uh, discussions focus on uh, India-Japan collaboration, how it can be taken forward, or how, how does, is, is there a cross-learning happening on a structured way? I think that is the question. Sorry, uh, Sajid-san, your voice is a bit breaking, so I could not uh, exactly catch the uh, question. So could you uh, repeat the question again? So one of the other questions from the audience is, mm -hmm. uh, what is the extent of experience sharing uh -huh. between Japanese companies and the Japanese managers and their counterparts in India. Is there a, for example, in within Toshiba, do you have a structured process for this type of meetings to happen between your Japanese and Indian counterparts? Or does it happen only as required? Basis? Okay, so uh, as a, uh, I shared in my presentation, one attempt is uh, uh, obviously that global IT training. And uh, apart from that, there are some the programs uh, so that the uh, people in India and Japan, not only India and Japan, but globally could gather and uh, study. And uh, that is more like a management program. And uh, that is, uh, uh, I think, held uh, once in a year. And of course, uh, our company would uh, uh, send some of our managements to join this management program. And during this session, they'll be able to like understand, interact, and uh, discuss what is like the difference and how further they can do the collaboration, etc. So there are such uh, opportunities uh, in Toshiba. Hope that answers uh, the question. Mm. Uh, one more question, um, do the Japanese companies find a person, for example, you did answer it in a way, but uh, in fact, Dr. Uh, Professor Kusumano also did that, but the question here is, who has, uh, for example, left Toshiba mm. and tried uh, to do some business, uh, entrepreneurship, but, uh, you know, as uh, you also mentioned, chances of an entrepreneur new venture succeeding is very low. Hmm. Some say it will be 90% uh, failure. Hmm. So if they don't succeed, uh, but they have gained a lot of experience in the process, you know, for example, how not to do things. So uh, would you, you, you mean uh, Toshiba, would Toshiba consider uh, to take such people back into their uh, company? Uh, that's a, that's an excellent question. So I really like to see that to happen. And uh, at least in Toshiba Software India, I welcome those who uh, really want to come back and uh, contribute to Toshiba based on his experience outside. 
No issues. No. <laughs> I'm not sure about the Japan side. <laughs> but I think uh, they are slowly changing, right? Mm. Traditionally, this may not have been accepted, but these, these days, hopefully, we have more flexibility. In mm. fact, uh, uh, Professor Kutumano did mention that if you want to join the big companies, Toyota, Toshiba, Sony, um, you are normally uh, taken fresh from the, you also mentioned this, that yes. people are fresh from the college. So um, these guys who have uh, tried entrepreneurship but failed uh, will find it difficult to get back into, uh, they will need to keep trying different uh, other ventures, but they cannot be accepted back into the business, traditional mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. so that's why I mean, the mindset is uh, same or is it changing, especially in the smaller companies. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you find the, that it is uh, very difficult to get back into business or uh, get back into uh, employment or do you see a mindset change happening in the company? Yeah, so I think uh, it's changing, slowly changing, but not, not, not entirely changing. I see some good example that uh, the uh, Maybe uh, even in Toshiba, th those are people who joined as a lateral recruitment are making a remarkable contribution. So that way, I think the uh, slowly the, the mobility of the people would increase more. And that way, I think the possibility for making the innovation would become higher because uh, I believe innovation is not something like uh, you invent something from zero. It's more like uh, you combine some existing technologies and build something new. There are such innovations, right? So if you are just stuck in one company, the possibility is low. If you introduce some other aspects from outside, I think there's a good chance that innovation will happen. So that way, I really want to see such more mobility in terms of the employment. Uh, there is one more question. Mm -hmm. um, how to reduce the gap? I'm, I'm reading from uh, uh, this, so please pardon my slowness in reading, but how to reduce the big gap in understanding by the domain experts to provide detailed data for digitalization and the expected data from the AI experts or IT analysts. So what he's saying is, there's a gap between the user uh, understanding and the expert understanding. So how does one bridge this gap? Is there other than only discussion? You did mention that discussion is a first point. Mm, mm, mm. That's actually a very good question. And uh, as uh, I uh, shared with you, we have the R&D division. Uh, they uh, work in the area of AI. And uh, I think in this area of AI, how to get both the domain knowledge and the data science expertise is the key to success. And uh, I think even in Toshiba, the number of the people who has both the capability is limited. So what I think is a more practical way is that you have the uh, 
right combination of people who has domain knowledge and who have the expertise in the data science. And uh, these guys work together in the same team. That is, uh, I think, the most uh, uh, the practical way to better uh, fill the gap. And uh, you should not really expect a Superman <laughs> who has both. Of course, uh, there are a uh, few people who can work like that. And uh, by the way, same thing I think can be said for the innovator and the entrepreneur. I think that uh, these are the two different capability. So I'm not sure uh, Steve Jobs had both, but uh, for example, if you want to educate someone to be innovative, or maybe you want to educate some, some entrepreneurship in the school, what I suggest is uh, not try to uh, have a person who has both capability. And rather than that, uh, you should better teach how you can have the right person in the right combination. So that is a more practical way, I think. But uh, mm -hmm. taking on from what we just now said, mm -hmm. do you think uh, this innovation skill or innovation ability can be taught? Or is it something that um, people are born with? Um, I think, in some, to some extent, it can be taught. Mm. I, I know it is uh, going off into the field of uh, psychology or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Especially when you talk about the incremental kind of innovation, definitely, I think there should be some methodology you can apply. Okay. I'm not sure about the, the really destructive kind of innovation. Mm. Yeah, okay. Uh, there is one question, um, not directly related with the topic, but about Toshiba in general. Mm -hmm. Ask, uh, what are the efforts made by Toshiba for creating brand awareness in India? Um, maybe for the software side, you can answer. And uh, not for the full Toshiba business. But mm. uh, your, your customers are within India or outside? Um, for my company, the Toshiba Software India, the majority of the customers are in Japan. They are the Toshiba Group divisions, like uh, maybe the semiconductor company and some other companies, right? So they asked DSIP to work on the software development, right? So, which means um, we are not, at least at this moment, we are not doing the big business in India locally, right? From that sense, uh, may, the brand awareness may not be have been really important. However, brand awareness is important in a different way, which means for the recruitment of the excellent resources the talents here in India. And um, that is something we really want to enhance uh, these days. And uh, maybe that's one reason I, uh, joined the session so that uh, uh, people would know more about Toshiba and uh, Toshiba Software India. Thank you, I think, uh, for joining because this in a way answers another question which was raised by another of the viewers. It says, what Toshiba can do to compete in the Indian market with other companies? But you have in a way answered it, mm -hmm. but uh, so you are not really looking 
at it currently, but maybe in the future, you would look, like to focus on the Indian market. Definitely, right? definitely. And uh, as I shared with you, uh, it's not only our company uh, who are doing business uh, in India, uh, meaning the Toshiba, right? So there are many other companies, uh, for example, TJPS, uh, the joint venture with the JSW, they have the, uh, uh, they built the thermal power plant and uh, we have uh, the Toshiba elevator, etc. So the idea is that we can collaborate with these companies and come up with an innovative solution and provide that within the Indian market. Mm. There is uh, one uh, slightly um, mm. question. This is uh, uh, in it says in Japan, some of the labor laws uh, related uh, understanding is good, especially about contribution to the provident fund when working in Japan. Mm -hmm. Aware of the provident fund concept in India, and um, what what would you comment on this? Do you have any comments on this? Uh, meaning uh, the some uh, is that the uh, the question regarding some uh, the obstacle for the Indian people to work in Japan? Yeah. Ah. Uh, so I'm not really an expert in that area, but what uh, the, my uh, understanding is that uh, there's a uh, treaty between India and Japan, so that uh, the uh, those people who work the Indian people work in Japan would not have uh, that uh, disadvantage in terms of the provident fund. So that is my understanding, but uh, since I'm not the expert, maybe uh, I'm not the right person to answer to this question. Very sorry. Uh, one last question. Uh, 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 can you share with, uh, with all of us, uh, what are Toshiba's plans for digital and software transformation of your company? And how does it ensure a quality? Quality aspect mm -hmm. you did. Mm -hmm. Plans for the digital and software transformation. Do you see any challenge and are you working on it? Mm. Uh, that's a very really good question. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> a tough question. So, uh, yeah, one thing uh, I uh, can share with you is that uh, since Toshiba, as you can see in this uh, slide, uh, sorry, this is not the slide, just one moment. Uh, okay. So Toshiba has variety of domains, right? And uh, if we can combine these domains, we can have a innovative solution. And uh, one way to do this Toshiba in-house is to practice something new uh, within Toshiba. And that is actually happening. Uh, one example is there's a building called the Smart Community Center in Kawasaki, Japan, which was built in 2013. And um, many Toshiba group companies uh, gather in this building. This building, since uh, it's the Toshiba building, we embed many technology in this building. Let's say the elevator and uh, all the air conditioner, et cetera, everything. And uh, those can be connected with IoT. And Toshiba can do a lot of tests, meaning the smart community center could act as a test bed of the uh, Toshiba technology. 
and uh, we can try many things. We can gather data, we can do analysis of the data and uh, come up with some attractive solution that can be proposed to Toshiba customer. So that's one way the Toshiba can internally uh, do their digitalization inside. That's one example. And uh, another example is, uh, which I uh, touched upon in this slide regarding the healthcare. So in order to have the uh, good prediction through the AI, the actual data from individual is required. And what Toshiba did is to gather the data from the Toshiba employee, of course, with the consent of uh, the each employment, and this is volunteer based. And um, some of the Toshiba employees even shared their genomic data, right? And uh, for the further study, right? So this kind of in-house research analysis using the in-house data is another way to accelerate the digitalization within Toshiba. And then we can propagate to our customer. And uh, yeah, and I think you talked about quality. So maybe the quality, uh, we cannot like uh, change everything overnight. So it should be like in the phased manner. So the conventional way and the, the digitalized way would for the time being co reside and uh, make sure that uh, everything is okay. Then we make the uh, switch up. I think uh, that's the appropriate, uh, the approach. Uh, there's one um, person who is uh, looking at is Toshiba open to work with Indian startup IT companies who could help Toshiba to serve its customers in Japan. Mm -hmm. How can we engage with Toshiba India? Let me come back with you <laughs> later. <laughs> <laughs> At this moment, I do not have the uh, answer. However, uh, I personally would definitely like to interact with the Indian startups and uh, have the collaboration with them. And that will definitely bring in benefit to not only Toshiba, but to accelerate the collaborative innovation between India and Japan. I'm sure about that. And uh, yeah, so you can personally reach out to me. Thank you. And I think in your position as uh, the chairperson for the Chamber of uh, Japan Chamber of Commerce, you can be a great uh, influencer, not just for Toshiba, but Japanese yes. business. Mm. I truly hope so. Mm. Thank you very much again for joining us and we have come Thank to you. the end of the uh, session and it has been a great learning for all of us. I'm sure people have enjoyed from the depth and the variety of questions that we have got today. It shows that everybody was very excited about and have learned um, not just about Toshiba's approach, but the case studies that you share. I think that has left a great uh, mark on people who could understand quickly what, uh, what you want to say. So I think that is the sign of a, a subsidiary who could uh, bring out a, a complex issue to a very simple um, state. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Goodbye. Bye.